If you were to read through the first section of Matthew, and if you read through the first section of, of Luke, you would get most of what we call the Christmas story, but you'd still be missing out of it a lot because a lot of what Christmas is about would have to include the dozens of prophecies of the Old Testament. The uh, titles that were read earlier, The Rod of Jesse, Emmanuel. A lot of the titles that are given are from Isaiah, and it's a love story. It plays out over hundreds of years. It's not a God who decides on a whim to do what he does. It is a God who's planned for months and years and centuries before an event comes about. So in Matthew chapter 2, if we can stand for a a minute and just uh, take these words to heart. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east. They came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. I'm going to read that verse again. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I was thinking this week about what the most important days of, of our lives are. There's certain moments that when they're happening, you know that these are foundational moments. These are moments in which everything that's going to come after this is going to be built upon this, and you're never going to, to quite forget it no matter what else happens in your life. And then there's other moments that you think you're going to hold on to that you don't. For instance, you'll probably remember the the moment your child is born, but you probably don't remember their first laugh. You might remember the first time they broke your car, but you don't remember the first time that they waved or smiled. If I was to get you to write down what the most important day of your your life was, some people would say it's the day your child was born. Some people would would say it was it was the the day that you were married. Uh, That's those are those are physical responses and relationship responses, and those are those are good and absolutely fine. Some people would go the spiritual route, say that it was the day that they were saved. Some people would say. Uh, a variety of, of other things, a, a day that they uh, 
were cured from cancer or whatever it is that is a day that changed everything. Whatever this day was, what would you allow to prevent you from being there? If you've ever had children, then you had hopefully planned ahead before the child was born. You figured out what hospital you're going to go to, how long it's going to take to get there. If you had other children, uh, you find someone to watch your child so that the child is not running around the operating room uh, while the other child is being born. If you're, being, if, you're, uh, if you're focusing on your wedding, then you probably asked for time off. You've made sure that all of the arrangements were there. You better have made sure that you asked the preacher if that date worked in advance. And you didn't hope he just showed up, which has happened to me, by the way. Planning ahead. Looking to the future. Surely you would have done whatever it took to get there. Surely you would have made whatever preparations needed to happen before this day that was the most important. Surely nothing would stop you from getting there. If your wife calls you and tells you she is in labor, you do not respond with, well, honey, when the Cowboys game is over, I will get there as soon as I can. It is, the, it is, it is a foundational moment. There is no obstacle which should not be crossed for you to get there. You ignore speeding laws and traffic laws and red lights if, you, if you're able to. You do whatever it takes to get there because the most important days of your life, you want to be present but what happened on Christmas day the first Christmas day what happened on the day of the birth of Christ was not just the most important day in Mary and Joseph's life it was Up until that point, the most important day in history after the creation. It was a day in which God Almighty, the King of the universe, the perfect, infinite God decides to embody a finite body. The God that is infinite limits himself to a human form. He limits himself to the human experience. But he's doing something new here. He is changing the world here. God is becoming a man. Every other religion had some kind of, of notion of there being a God, there being a divine being, and a lot of them had a notion of, of God's interacting with men, but usually it was either a man in their religion became a God, or the gods had relations with men and women, and, and therefore had a, you know what they called half-gods or demigods like Hercules, which has been made into a thousand movies. But for the first time anywhere, someone said that God became a man. This is the wrong direction. This is, the, this is not the direction we've been talking about. We've been talking about in our religions of, of people becoming divine, of people going from the brokenness, going from the, the corruption, going from just human weakness to something that is beyond it. That's, this is the wrong order. This is the wrong direction. Perfection coming to the imperfect. And God in this moment makes this day the most important day in history. A God who had never known what it was like to be hungry. The God who had never known what it was like to be cold and lonely. A God who had never known what it was like to want to have a friend. And then to have that friend betray you. God was doing all kinds of 
new things here. The same Jesus who said, blessed are the merciful, learn to show mercy in human form. The one who said, blessed are the peacemakers, dealt with squabbling all around him. A man who knew what it was like to be hungry and cold. Jesus who, who went from, in, a, in Genesis in the Garden of Eden, says that the Lord walked among the garden, not in, human, not in physical form, but his presence was there. And th- he decided that he was going to learn to walk as an infant. The trip and a fall to grow, to become human. It was a day in which God dwelled with us. There were a lot of people in this story and in Scripture that had to sacrifice a lot to be there. You had Mary and Joseph who sacrificed a lot. Mary, this, this young teenage girl. The sacrifice just wasn't just being a teenage mom. The sacrifice was that anyone who has children that young knows that whatever future you planned is now going to be reoriented around this child. Whatever she hoped for, whatever it is she wanted to be, whatever it is she wanted to do, whatever future she dreamed of, that future was gone because her future was now to be caretaker for Jesus. Joseph, this man who was one of the few people in the scriptures that are called righteous. A sterling reputation. At the time, it was considered a very shameful thing. Now we know that all sins are equal and there's no sin that God won't forgive if you truly repentant. But at the time, because people didn't move out of their community and you stayed literally in the same thing for generations in the towns of of, of, of 300, which is the average town at the time. Reputations would stick around for generations, and Joseph was throwing his reputation away to take Mary as his wife. They sacrificed a lot. And they loaded up the supplies that they needed. And they traveled to Bethlehem to report for the census. And she gave birth in a stall surrounded by livestock. The shepherds sacrificed a lot. I don't know what they had been expecting that night. The usual routine of boredom. keeping their flocks at night under the stars. Doing the same thing they had done night in and night out. Day in and day out. And because they were willing to listen, a heavenly host shows up and says, peace on earth to all those who please God. Go and find this child lying in a manger. And they gave up not just their night, but they gave up their purpose. They spent the rest of the, of the time that, that they're mentioned in Scripture running around the region proclaiming what they had experienced. Suddenly they were going to be the oddballs. They were going to be the annoying people that keep pestering you. They're going to be the ones running around saying, I saw the King of Heaven. But there's another group. The Magi, these men, they were either astrologers or court advisors. Uh, Some versions call them kings, but the most uh, reliable understanding of them are as tribal leaders. These men were used to people bowing to them in the streets as they walked by These men were used to having the seats of honor. These men were used to literally controlling the whole wealth of the family. These men were used to comfort and power. 
And they traveled, what is, they traveled from what is now Iran over to Jerusalem. They sat on camels and traveled for months and months and maybe even up to a year. Texas is hot, but we have air conditioning. And traveling for months through the desert on the back of a camel because of a star, because of a message, because of a guide. They left their families. They left their lives of comfort. And they showed up after Jesus had been born. And they paid honor. These men who were used to honor paid honor to a king who was greater than they were. And then the shepherds and the wise men reacted exactly the way that you would hope that they would react. They went and told everyone. The shepherds run through the region proclaiming what they have experienced. The wise men show up proclaiming why they are there. They are there to see the king of the Jews. They don't keep it a secret. They don't hide it. They don't try to disguise it. They are open with their mission. Their mission is to find the one that they have been guided towards. And it is because of their response that it makes everyone else around them come into into stark contrast. There were certain people involved in the birth of Christ and then soon after, the wise men, the shepherds, Mary and Joseph. But there's a lot of people missing. There's a lot of people missing that night. Herod, the puppet king of Israel, the one who's supposed to be the king of the Jews under Caesar's command, finds out that the true king has been born, and where does he go? Nowhere. Israel at this time, Jerusalem at this time, had an ex, has a, had a uh, estimated population of between 60,000 and 80,000 people. And the scriptures say that Jerusalem was aflame with gossip because of the wise men showing up saying they were there to find the Messiah. 80,000 people, and yet in Bethlehem they were not there. And before you start thinking, well, travel is very hard. If you go on Google Maps and you figure out where Bethlehem is from Jerusalem proper, you only have to go 4.34 miles. 80,000 people. And none of them traveled five miles to see the King of Heaven. Why? Why? Maybe they were busy. Some of them were just trying to survive. Some of them were working and just trying to keep food in in their families. Some of them had too many political games to play. Some of them didn't fit into their schedule. Some of them had something else they were doing. Whatever the reason is, they had something more important to do than to be in the presence of God. Can you imagine sitting there either in the house that the Magi found them in or in the stable and being in the presence of God? Can you imagine if Mary passed over the child and said, you want to hold him and you are holding the one that would die for your sins? His cries are nothing compared to the cries that he will Give as he is suffering for you. But when you're holding this child or even is sitting in the in the in the room, you would be literally in the presence of God on earth. And they had been hoping for a Messiah. They had been hoping that God would come. They had been hoping that God would send the deliverer that they needed. And eighty thousand people had something more important to do. 
than to be in the presence of God. And this shows you that we have not changed so much in the last 2,000 years. Each one of us, most days, finds something more important to do than to spend time in prayer in the presence of God. Every Sunday morning in America, tens of millions of people who claim that the most important thing in their life is Jesus Christ will find something more important to do than to be among the people of God and the presence of God. We have so much going on. We have so much going on. We have so much going on that even the people of God will go through Christmas and miss Christ. Regardless of whether it's at Christmas time or some other time of the year when we miss out on Christ we've missed the most important thing but not right now not at this moment 